Awesome. Thanks so much, Liz, and really excited to be with all of you today to discuss getting the yes, what investors look for in early stage startups. My name is John Calgill. I'm a partner at Coast to Noah Ventures. We're an early stage machine learning focused venture capital firm in San Francisco and joined today by two of my favorite investors, um, one who's in the Valley with me and one who's out in Toronto. So I'll let them introduce themselves. Great. Uh, so I'm Jamie Rosenblatt, uh, a principal at Golden Ventures, uh, which is a seed stage uh, venture capital fund uh, based out of Toronto, but investing across North America. Um, and I'm Ivy. I work at Point72 Ventures. Um, our, the AIML team within Point72 Ventures is based out in San Francisco. Um, and uh, But we invest all across the U.S., uh, North America, as well as um, in the EU. Awesome. Well, just to kick us off today, it would um, be really interesting to hear from both Ivy and Jamie a little bit more on some of the specific things that you all look for when you're evaluating companies that are in the machine learning space. I think it's commonly said, you know, VCs look to invest in great teams. They look to invest in big markets. But when you're looking at companies that are using machine learning or building machine learning infrastructure, what are some of the specific things that you spend a little bit more time evaluating? Yeah, I'll, I'll take a first stab at that, if that's okay with you, Jamie. Um, so at Point72, I think um, for us, you know, we, we see AI ML as a very critical means to an end, but it's still very much a means to an end, right? Um, what, we, what we've seen time and again is, uh, you know, customers will try out a solution if uh, there is some AI, uh, you know, I, I think it helps you get a foot in the, in the door, but at the end of the day, they never buy AI for AI's sake. Uh, they buy a solution to their problem. And so we, um, place a lot of emphasis on you know, like the chosen application that you decided to go after, how you decided to drill in on the specific use case or the specific point in the food chain uh, and the workflow in order to derive value. And not only that, how quickly and you know, to what degree can you deliver ROI for your customers? Because um, even though a uh, solution could be really valuable 10 years out, if uh, it doesn't do anything within the first year, you're probably going to be in a lot of trouble for like when you come up for renewal. Um, and I think the second point to that is that we place a lot of emphasis on the team as well um, in order to really understand the uh, chosen sector that you've gone after to really drill down on that target problem. You really have to uh, have a good understanding of the domain, right? And so um, we'd love to see teams that combine technical excellence with domain expertise, um, somebody who really knows the nuts and bolts of operations and how these businesses actually think. Yeah, I, um, I'll echo uh, much of what Ivy said. Uh, you know, speaking as a seed stage investor, someone who views themselves as the first institutional capital that goes into a company, um, I'm going to double down on the the team uh, bucket uh, because, you know, as we're fond of saying, you know, beti between the time we invest and the time there's a sort of ha happy outcome for everyone, the only uh, sort of certainty is that there's this massive sea of uncertainty that you need to have uh, extraordinary trust and confidence in in the team that you're supporting to sort of navigate. Uh, and so with respect to team, um, to Ivy's point, a, a couple of things there uh, on the, the technical expertise front. Um, obviously, you need to have the credentials and the experience, uh, you know, whether through, uh, you know, your academic background, your work background, projects that you've worked on, and we'll go into your GitHub and take a look and, and all the rest of it. Um, you know, one point uh, in, in post-pandemic investing that I think, uh, you know, sometimes may, may catch uh, companies off guard is the importance of references. And so, you know, letting people know in your network that they may be contacted or things of that nature, that's how we're going to get to know whether your team is sort of, uh, you know, as great as, as it appears on paper. Uh, then uh, on, on the idea of, um, so you have the technical expertise on the team and then you have the industry expertise on the team and um, can be played by the same person. But really what we're looking for there uh, is someone that understands, uh, you know, the non-obvious problems that uh, you show potential for really meaningful solutions. Uh, have you lived or worked in this space and understand the workflows and what potential integrations you're going to need to build? The the sort of reason why industry expertise is so interesting is it acts for a, a, a proxy to enormous value that you can create from a, a product perspective, among other things, and in customer empathy and knowing sort of where to go to. So. Uh, team really is, uh, especially at the early stage, super important to to investors. Awesome. I'd echo that the team is super important, as is the use case. And I think another thing I spend a lot of time looking at when we're evaluating early stage machine learning startups, especially in the applied machine learning space, is just the data set. 
and how rich is it? How frequently is it refreshed? How easily will it be for other people to access it? Um, you know, it is often, I think, said internally at Coast to Noah that better data trumps better algorithms. And so as much as we care about the quality of your technical team, and it's incredibly important to us, it's also um, important to us, especially in machine learning companies, to understand your data strategy. Um, so why don't we actually talk a little bit? I think, you know, we're talking a lot about application layer machine learning companies and the importance of domain expertise. Obviously, there's also infrastructure. And I think a lot of the companies that have you know, presented today have been building, you know, enabling technology, making it easier for data scientists to build and deploy machine learning companies um, or machine learning models, I should say. Um, tell me a little bit, um, Jamie and Ivy, how you evaluate machine learning infrastructure companies differently than vertically focused applications in machine learning. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, I think when it comes uh, to vertical uh, AI applications, you're really looking uh, for that day one value. Uh, you know, the 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 choice of algorithm is, or choice of sort of uh, technical backend is important insofar as it is appropriately matched uh, with the business value that you're driving. But, uh, you know, to, to echo some of the points that both of you have made, um, it's really about the business use case and, and how people are you know, uh, interacting with that, that particular application. It, within our own portfolio, a company called Benchside provides sort of antibody um, uh, recommendation engine for uh, bench scientists to sort of uh, identify the ingredients that they'll use in their experiments to use, you know, a, a really uh, quick and rough shorthand. Uh, there was enormous value from day one there, and that was one of the, the primary things um, you, you know, that, that interested us in that investment. When it comes to, to sort of the infrastructure or non-business uh, end use focused companies, um, you know, there's a few things. Uh, but first of all, again, uh, not to sound like a broken record, but like, uh, are we talking to the individual, the founding team that is best suited to sort of construct this and, and sort of push the frontier investment forward? Uh, when we look, we, we invested in a company called Xanadu, which is a photonic based quantum computer. You know, that's a great example of, uh, you know, uh, an infrastructure and enabling technology where this was a team that was uniquely composed to go after the problem. There were very few people globally that would be able to do it. And uh, just one other key piece beyond the team, so I don't sound like a broken record, is when we're thinking about infrastructure or, or enabling technologies, we think about the size of the opportunity that they enable. It needs to be disproportionate. When you're talking about uh, an enabling technology, oftentimes you're talking about something for which the market is quite nascent. Uh, that means that the use cases may not have fully matured or that the market isn't fully there, but it's coming. And so, you know, what sort of market are you enabling? Is it going to be large or is it going to be small? If it's going to be very large, then we're willing to take or underwrite the risk of if they build it, will people come? If the reward for uh, investing and, and sort of uh, building out uh, infrastructure is very small, then, then the incentive to underwrite that risk goes down for at least for us. Yep. And um, I think at the, the risk of uh, making it sound like we all work at the same firm, I'm going to echo a lot of what Jamie uh, has said so far, which is that at the end of the day, um, even for, for horizontal you know, picks and shovels, AIML um, companies and, and technologies, it comes down to TAM for us too. Um, and you know, what we look at in order to size the addressable market um, uh, comes down to who are you trying to sell to, um, who's the decision maker, and who's actually going to use this? And uh, does that population of, of uh, end users add up to enable you to, to build a billion dollar business? Right? And I, I think that unfortunately, as much as you know, we'd like to, to think that uh, a lot of uh, the Fortune 1000 as resource rich as they may be, um, are investing a lot in hiring top of, uh, you know, top of market data science and AIML talent, um, you're, you're going to be lucky to find uh, one or two data scientists, right? Um, and so, um, you know, I, I wouldn't necessarily operate with the presumption that uh, those end customers will be there. I think it's really important to go out and do that work, make sure that uh, however you're positioning your tool, and where you want to sit in the food chain, um, there there will be a big enough market to support it, or at least the tailwinds are such that the market will grow to enable you to become a billion dollar business. Awesome. So we've talked a lot about importance of use cases and bringing on domain expertise. And given so much of the audience today, I think is technical. I think it'd be interesting to talk a little bit about um, either anecdotes you have in your portfolio of you know founders who've gone out and found domain expertise or found the great use case or who have cultivated it. How how should technical um, 
you know, uh, data scientists who are thinking about building machine learning company think about use cases and identify really good ones and, and potentially augment their team with domain expertise. Yeah, I'd say that there's, um, you know, there's no one cut and dry playbook into how to find the exact right domain expertise for your team, right? Um, and um, I'd say that direct industry experience is a great starting point, um, but um, there's this question of uh, what am I actually getting, and like, and at what level should I uh, potentially recruit at? Um, you know, we've seen uh, a couple examples here where there, um, in in a number of different sectors, there are. Um, you know, like two or three companies that are trying to tackle the same problem. One may have hired somebody who's a domain expert that came in as an ex, you know, C-suite or CEO of a like major um, incumbent in that space. Um, another may have brought in a uh, a domain expert who represents the operational point of view, right? Somebody who uh, knows the day-to-day -day work very well and what the end user pain point could be and um it's it's kind of a like you know it, it's a, a tale of, of sort of two uh, very different paths almost the the companies that bring in the c-suite exec and you know have that point of view um i think uh, overly uh, represented end up zeroing in on perhaps like the the right uh, problems to get you a foot in the door and the highest priority problems at the uh, enterprise level that um, customers will pay for. Uh, but oftentimes that comes at potentially solving the wrong problem uh, or at least incompletely solving the problem when it comes to actually building a tool and executing out on the product roadmap. Um, whereas the company that might bring in a sector expert at the operations level um, is solving a very, uh, is solving exactly the right problem, has built the right thing on their product roadmap um, such that they do deliver higher ROI right out the gate than the other competitor that brought in the CEO, but um, may not necessarily uh, have the right industry connections or um, can get walked into the the high value deals. And so it's uh, sometimes you can get lucky and you can find somebody who can deliver both. But you know, oftentimes it's worth thinking about really like what um, what you actually do want to um, that domain expert to bring to the table as a full time member of the team. Yeah. So um, I'll say two things. Uh, you know, the, the generic uh, advice that you'll hear from investors is that you go find, you know, if you're a technical person, uh, go find domain expertise, um, you know, and I'll talk a bit about how one one does that. And then the, the second point I want to make, which is equally important, is it's, you know, don't feel like it's impossible to go in the other direction, which is, you know, you have uh, a technical solution and then you can actually go find a problem. It's not one that you'll find popularly written about, but it's one that I've observed and I'll give you an example in a second. So. Um, with respect to sort of finding domain expertise, um, you, you know, uh, for, for a technical founder or, or whatever it may be, uh, the short answer is hustle. Uh, you know, uh, the same way that uh, business people have set up all these different platforms to go meet technical co-founders, uh, you know, there's the other side of the coin. So there are institutional examples like, um, you know, on deck down in, in the valley or, you know, if, if I'm going to sort of plant my patriotic flag, uh, Creative Destruction Lab here in Toronto, which does a fantastic job of sort of exposing highly technical companies to, um, you know, a, a plurality of different um, industry stakeholders from across different sectors. So uh, the, the short answer is hustle. Uh, business people who are getting into the entrepreneurial world are often, you know, uh, I'm um, really, really interested to meet you if you have technical, uh, you know, uh, skill set um, on the idea of moving from, hey, I, I have, uh, uh, you know, I maybe don't have domain expertise, but I got something real here. Um, you know, the example that I had in mind was a company that I, a, a great company that I had seen that had sort of applied, uh, you know, AI process uh, mining. Uh, and it was a really sort of uh, next level solution that they had built and, and they weren't sure where to take it. So uh, they just started reaching out to their networks and, and across sectors and testing, being like, hey, you're the VP of engineering in, in a life sciences shop or, or, you know, maybe you're the VP of engineering in a uh, sales and marketing shop. Um, this is what I built. Like, do you have an idea of where this might help or, or, or work for you? And so those conversations ended up in pilots. They validated some use cases by interacting with, with the folks there. And, and next thing you know, they have a company that's you know doing seven figures plus in, in annual recurring revenue. And so um, I, I think my takeaway here is that you can go in either direction, uh, but in both cases, it requires hustle, elbow grease, whatever cliche you want to throw at it and get in front of people who are actually going to use this thing. Totally echo all those points. And we've got many examples in our portfolio of both where a technical founder has brought on someone with domain expertise as a business co-founder and where a technical founder has gone out and built that domain expertise themselves. So I, I think both can work.
can uh, underline the point that intellectual curiosity, hustle, um, putting yourself in the industry uh, is is really critical, whichever path you take. Um, and I'll quickly highlight a portfolio company that we really like, a company called Aquabyte. Um, young technical founder, Brighton Shang, um, graduated from Princeton and heard about the aquaculture industry through a family friend and just got interested in it and dug in and dug in and dug in and ended up building a computer vision solution that automates aquaculture. Um, and what impressed me the most about him and what you know helped us get to yes was just how deeply he'd immersed himself in that industry, including going to industry conferences, connecting with you know large fish farmers, flying to Norway to spend time at, at various large fish farms in uh, in the country. So um, don't be afraid to get out there and, and, and engage with the real world if you're um, set on building the company without without a third party uh, joining you as a business business co-founder. I think uh, we've talked this point to death, which is like build domain expertise. Maybe yep. interesting to zoom out a little bit and talk about other common pitfalls uh, for technical founders that are starting machine learning companies. Um, maybe you want to start, Jamie? Yeah, um, uh, th there's, there's a couple that, that jump to mind. Um, there are obvious ones and maybe some non-obvious ones. Uh, uh, one that I'll start with is uh, the idea that the value that your uh, that machine learning or artificial intelligence provides to your product evolves over time and understanding how your business needs to evolve with that. And what I mean is, um, you know, people talk a lot about data network effects or the idea that if I get this sort of uh, self-replenishing uh, source of data, um, I'm going to be able to out-execute uh, against my competitors and it's just going to build the lead forever. But it's it's a bit of a, a principle of diminishing returns. Uh, if 80% is what matters to everyone in terms of the accuracy of your prediction, to take an example, um, the data network effect that you sort of talked about in your longer term vision uh, becomes less relevant because presumably competitors can catch up there and whatever incremental, um, you know, value you drive uh, is not really worth that much to the end user. And so it's about, okay, if the data moat gives me an advantage or my predictive ability gives me an initial advantage, how do I, how do I leverage that head start? to get my hooks into the company more broadly and, and understand that AI can be a component of the solution, but there are other things that I need to invest in and think about as well. That could be integrations with other platforms. You know, that could be, you know, smoothing the onboarding process or figuring out pricing. So if I were to sort of summarize what that, that pitfall is, uh, it would be thinking that, hey, um, I've brought AI uh, to bear on this, this problem. Um, I'm done, the solution is built. No, uh, you have a head start, uh, the world evolves, your product and your thinking about how how uh, you're supporting your customer needs to evolve um, with it. Uh, and then uh, just one other problem that I'd, I'd sort of flag is, um, you know, uh, needing this idea that um, AI and, and, he, I, and I know that our audience is more sophisticated than that, even though, uh, you know, I don't I don't know what they look like. I'm just going to presume they're, they're they're more sophisticated than that. Uh, this idea that human and, and AI uh, are two sort of distinct uh, categorical entities. Um, there's nothing wrong with the idea of a, of a bionic AI or a, a product that leverages human in the loop to bootstrap you or otherwise inform your product decisions. So uh, understanding how, you know, not the platonic ideal, but something less than can actually add more day one value is, is a pitfall or a, a mode of thinking that I don't think uh, everyone necessarily defaults to. Yep. And uh, I'm going to um, pull on two threads that, that Jamie threw out. Um, one uh, is this idea of being thoughtful about how to strategically deploy AI ML. Um, the, the other is um, thinking about how to keep humans in the loop uh, in the balance. And I think they're, they're very like related, interrelated ideas. Um, I think the, the first point uh, or the first word of advice I want to give is um, you know, there are so many AI companies that or so many prospectively AI companies that um, want to that uh, I think over prioritize trying to make the AI model work when uh, in truth there's a ton of ways to deliver value to your customers that don't require you to wait until you have a functioning AI model as core to your business right and at the end of the day um, like the the stakeholders that will keep your business afloat are the customers that are going to pay you actual revenue not VCs right uh, I think the only people who really care about whether or not your your the thing that you're doing is powered by a computer versus a person uh, is the VCs. And for the most part, I don't know that VCs really know what they're talking about or what they actually want. Um, and so uh, I think that um, I, as much as you know, people dance around it, um, I don't think there's anything wrong with having humans in the loop to make sure that whatever it is that you're shipping, whether it's an answer or kind of a, a service, um, 
is actually at the level that uh, your your clients are expecting, right? Uh, because at the end of the day, again, nobody can, nobody will pay for AI, but they will pay a ton for solutions, um, no matter uh, whether it's a, a person or a computer that does it. Um, and I think that um, as you as you try to figure out that balance of you know when to start bringing in AI to your product, uh, there um, you know there is this kind of um, uh, like strange idea but we've seen um, time and again that revenue can be very addictive right and uh, it, as you as you get more customer demand there is this temptation to scale up your um, your service delivery operations your humans in the loop and continue servicing that revenue servicing that business um, uh, sometimes at the expense of further investing in the technology um, I that's a really delicate balance that we we have to um, you know, always help our portfolio companies to, to try to maintain. I don't think anyone has a tried and true formula for you know, what the ideal ratio should be, right? Um, but at the end of the day, I think that uh, in order to really be a breakout business, you will have to be a, a tech uh, forward, tech first business. Um, and uh, I think we all need to figure out, you know, what is the right balance for our specific company uh, in terms of scaling up the humans in the loop uh, versus uh, delaying revenue a little bit and so that you can further invest in the technology in order to enable future scale. Uh, John, I forgot. There's one other thing I wanted to add, uh, if that's okay. I know I'm breaking uh, Mr. Adji here. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't mention, uh, you know, something that's, uh, AI can produce a number of negative externalities. Um, bias is, is a hot topic in this space. Um, you know, you could be talking about, uh, uh, as it applies to the law, uh, sort of how it can adversely impact um, people of color or other socioeconomically marginalized groups. Um, you know, I'm not advocating for you to lead uh, a pitch to an investor with, you know, um, and here's a, a deep roadmap as to how we're going to think about bias within uh, how we build this company. But uh, I think that um, the people with the technical uh, uh, capacities to build these products need to think about how these are affecting the people that are actually using their products. Because, um, you know, whatever short term gain uh, you produce by getting distribution, uh, there's potential for enormous, uh, let's call it uh, net utility loss. Uh, hopefully not for all of humanity, but uh, we'll find out after the election. Sorry, that's probably too partisan, but anyways. <laughs> uh, no, great. I totally underline a lot of thoughts there. And specific on the question of, um, I think a unique challenge machine learning companies have relative to pure SaaS software companies, especially if there's a human in the loop, is this question of gross margin. So how much human in the loop you throw at it. And I think um, it is a very common problem to have to balance wanting to grow and needing to have humans in the loop in order to grow while also pacing your growth such that you can be investing in automation. And I think, um, you know, it's a very case by case basis, but I'd say typically we advise companies to try to still stay above 50% gross margin and have a path towards ultimately what you'd call software gross margins of 70 or 80%. Um, yeah. I think the last question I'd love to um, end with, and then I think we'll open it up to Q&A with the audience is uh, for Jamie and Ivy, like what was the last machine learning investment that you made and what was it that got you the yes? Yeah, um, so the, the last uh, investment in the space that I made was in uh, a, a company called uh, Crux OCM, uh, which is um, bringing AI and ML solutions to uh, control room operations for oil and gas companies. Um, and there are a few things that that really uh, got me excited about the space. Um, you know, sorry to default to it, but team, uh, Vicky and Roger, the co-founders are wonderful. Um, they bring all the best qualities to bear, uh, both from a, a, a technical expertise side of things, uh, as well as a domain uh, expertise uh, side of things. So you have a nice interdisciplinary mix. Um, you had a data set that was both uh, proprietary uh, and drove real improvements uh, across the product that could be leveraged from one customer to the next. Uh, and they had a really clear day one ROI that could be demonstrated um, both through piloting uh, as well, which meant less sort of integration and, and uh, lower friction for uh, customers to adopt as well as once it was actually deployed and they, had, they, they could, you know, build case studies on the back of it. So, um, 
aside from the team being phenomenal um, and interdisciplinary and technically superior, this was a company that had clear ROI in a very, very large space uh, and was going to have real data network effects uh, from a proprietary data set. So all the cliche buzz things that you've heard us say uh, over the past 25 minutes, uh, they checked all those boxes and, uh, and the customers raved about them. Yep. Uh, we have a number of unannounced investments that we recently closed, but I'll, uh, I'll pick our, our most recent announced investment, um, which is um, a business based out of New York called Toggle Industries. Um, what they do is apply um, robotics and automation to the rebar uh, fabric, cage fabrication and assembly process. Um, and I think, uh, as, as Jamie pointed out with his company, um, a lot of the, the boxes were checked here too with Toggle, that they've instrumented out the uh, entirety of the rebar process end to end um, so that you, know, you are gathering data that uh, has never really been collected before, right? In terms of how um, all these components are manufactured. Um, and there's very clear ROI um, to, to the end user too. You know, the rebar components are delivered on time. Um, these construction, like they, these are core structural elements. And so the, um, you know, like the building or the sky rise can't continue to, um, you know, like uh, can't continue construction until these elements are delivered in place just in time, and that's a you know, that's a major bottleneck that um, Toggle is helping uh, deliver more precision on for their customers. Very cool. I'll, I'll volunteer. I last investment I made, and it's really breaking because we this week, and it's not announced yet, so I won't say the name. But is a company that's in the identity verification space and focused specifically on um, emerging markets where uh, identity is a very unsolved problem, and uh, people lack high quality identity cards. So the way that this problem is solved today is take a photo of your license, and we'll validate that it's real. Uh, that doesn't work in emerging markets when the licenses are uh, lack photographic identification on them and are very low quality. So what these guys have done is built um, proprietary integrations into various identity authorities where they're able to pull a user's picture. And then they ask people to take a picture of themselves and are able to use facial recognition to validate it against um, the photo and the identity authority. And from a machine learning perspective, what they did was, which was very interesting, was basically de-bias a lot of open source facial recognition products that are um, really bad on uh, darker faces uh, and are, we're actually able to make it uh, basically equal accuracy, whether you're white, black, Indian, et cetera. So uh, really excited about the investment and I think hits on a couple of themes we've talked about here in terms of ROI and proprietary data sets. Um, so with that, I think we'll turn it over to Liz to um, uh, moderate some Q&A from the audience. All right, <laughs> wonderful, great discussion. Um, we do have a few questions in the chat. First of all, someone says, great talk. Um, and so someone's wondering, what AI trends are you most excited about today? Who wants this is to a, 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 oh, sorry, go ahead, Jamie. Go ahead, Ivy, go ahead. Thanks, guys. Um, so, uh, Necessarily neither here nor there in terms of giving you uh, ideas to start companies, but um, you know, I, the continued democratization of uh, AI is enabling uh, all sorts of you know really interesting companies to be founded. Right, I, I'd say that like my favorite part of this job is every day I learn about you know some problem that I like is very obscure and very sector specific um, that I never would have thought was actually even a problem, much less a you know multi billion dollar problem that. All of a sudden, um, the recent advances in AI has enabled a um, the domain expert to actually go out and build a, a company to actually uh, move the needle in solving the problem. And so, um, like a recent example is we we've been looking at companies in the sales and use tax automation space. I had no idea that that was actually a, like a, a big issue, and it turns out that uh, it, it is something that um, is uh, worth tens of billions of dollars in, in liabilities for um, for businesses. I I I am um, I'll, I'll volunteer one. I'll volunteer uh, one. So I, I think so I, um, I think um, the intersection, the intersection of, life of life sciences and artificial, uh, and artificial intelligence uh, continues to be uh, really really interesting. Um, you know, uh, from the life sciences uh, side, um, you know, with when you think about um, the emergence of uh, bioinformatics, uh, among other things, what you're seeing at this intersection is interdisciplinary teams. 
um, leveraging, uh, you know, disparate data sets that, you know, one, uh, no one technical person has sort of uh, mastery over, uh, combining those to meaningfully move forwards, uh, drug discovery, uh, treatment options, uh, and a number of other things, which I think create a ton of value for sort of humanity writ large without sounding too cheesy, but also uh, are, are in a space where there are enormous players already dumping tons of resources looking for solution to better sort of um, uh, shepherd or or otherwise uh, allocate uh, those dollars and, and those 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 uh, resources. So um, we've made two investments uh, in in that space, uh, Benchsci and uh, Protein Cure, uh, and both of those companies are doing great and and have sort of continued my uh, interest or or have uh, encouraged my interest in that space only to grow over uh, the last little bit. Totally. Most of what we discussed today was application layer and that continues to be a really exciting space. I'd say actually the area we've been most active over the last year has been in um, machine learning infrastructure and tooling for data scientists. And we're seeing so much happening there that I think will continue to enable um, companies to deploy machine learning more effectively and more efficiently. Uh, we just announced an investment today in a company called Coiled Computing, which is commercializing Dask, uh, an open source project that makes it easier for data scientists to do parallel computing on Python. So rather than having to migrate models onto Spark in order to push them into production, it makes it easier for data scientists to more rapidly deploy machine learning in production. Um, just an example of the type of stuff that we're seeing that we think has tremendous potential and that we're really excited about. Right, very interesting. Um, and that actually, I think, leads into the next question of, do you still invest in database companies um, in addition to all of those other really neat ideas? I think the answer for most to know would be, uh, I'd never say never. So yes, I think the answer is we, we still do look at companies there, but obviously uh, the database layer is an incredibly competitive one with a lot of companies at massive, massive scale. Um, and so it's, um, you know, I think what we would be looking for would be uh, truly world-class technologists. I mean, if you look at um, the companies that have been built, uh, building next-gen databases, they've all had really, you know, cream of the crop technologists. And then I think we'd have to understand um, what about the company is, you know, uh, unique and different and defensible from just the very large companies that are playing in the space. But I mean, you know, look, Snowflake was uh, declared dead about five times by various VCs early on who thought that it would never work. And there's a great blog post actually recently posted by a foundation capital on all the reasons Snowflake wouldn't work. And here we are today, we're a massive company. So I think there's still lots of interesting stuff happening in the data warehouse and database space. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, looks like we are just running over time. So we better wrap up. Um, Ivy, Jamie, and John, thank you so much for being here.